A coach gets up in front of a room full of potential athletic recruits and says, think of me like Willy Wonka. I have seven golden tickets that I can give to anyone I want. Don't worry if your test scores aren't that strong. I can always find a way to balance it out. That really happened at a top Ivy League school last week. Welcome to the world of athletic recruiting, where academics take a back seat and America's emphasis on entertainment value seems to mirror that of another empire from 2,000 years ago. Rome was once the greatest democratic republic. Business, art, and ideas flourished. So did sport. In particular was the rise of one peculiar sport, gladiator fighting. Sport designed by politicians to entertain and amuse the mindless masses. It also rose in popularity around the same time the Roman Empire began to fall towards its demise. And while I'm not saying that gladiator fighting was the sole cause of the downfall of the Roman Empire, the uptick in fights did lead to a blurred boundary of right and wrong and conflicting morals for the public. Today, one could say America is headed towards something similar. We're equally obsessed with sports, sports culture, and celebrity athletes. Now, don't get me wrong, I love sports. As captain of JV tennis, I'm actually someone who is proud of being last been off the bench in eighth grade basketball. <laughs> yeah, it's me. I acknowledge the power of the Olympics to bring the world together in peace to celebrate our common humanity. I spend my Tuesday morning scouring the waiver wire for fantasy football. And being from Philadelphia, saw recently how Villanova's buzzer beater brought my city energy for days. I marvel at the universal language of football, or you know, soccer, and a national pride it embodies. I also understand that sports teach our youth values such as ethics, cooperation, and fairness. This idea that sport may have led to the downfall, the spiraling downfall of the Roman Empire, coincidence or cause, let me ask a somewhat controversial question. Is there any evidence that having sports and academia so closely intertwined in our society leads to any academic or professional success? I understand that sports such as football and basketball are both economic behemoths and fully ingrained culturally into our society. They also, to their credit, provide reasonably equal opportunity to one, regardless of demographic, and potential future financial reward to its top competitors. However, they're just a small piece of our athletic puzzle. In other words, they don't cloak the rest. Brown University noted recently when getting rid of quite a few varsity sports, Many sports we devote resources to and recruit athletes for don't even help us build community. But let me back up. Up until high school, the world made sense to me. Those who did well academically received the attention they deserved. And sport was relegated to one hat in gym class and way to blow off some steam during recess. However, around me, I noticed parents were signing their kids up to, for youth sports and a rate fast my March Madness bracket got busted on an annual basis. In fact, 2008 studies showed that 75% of boys and 69% of girls aged 8 to 17 were involved in organized youth sport in the past year. Further, 61% of boys said sport was a big part of their identity as a person, which begs the question of why we're involving our kids in so much organized sport is the United States the second most obese country in the world, compared to Denmark, the third healthiest country in the world and also a country that has absolutely no organized sports teams affiliated with any of their educational bodies. In 2013, The Atlantic published an article contrasting high school culture around the world. It featured a recent immigrant from South Korea who noted that her new high school in New Jersey boasted of 18 sports teams, including a bowling team, no less than six tennis courts, and a large athletic hall of fame. However, she came from a school who played Soccer in a dirt pitch during recess, a city whose newspaper published uh, articles about academic achievement, and a country that ranked fourth in the world in mathematics. However, in her new surroundings, she found the sports obsessed culture, newspaper which published athletic accomplishments, and a school which had over half of its students play a sport, yet only 17% take an advanced placement course. Let me put this another way. 
Professor James Coleman, who wrote the defining report on sociology in American high schools for the U.S. Department of Education. Well, he noted that the innocent person walking into a U.S. high school and seeing that hallmark trophy case, well, he'd think they'd entered, quote, an athletic club, not an educational institution. So do you see where I'm going with this? This is called opportunity cost. The resources we spent on sport, instead put on academics instead, would it make a difference? Well, in Finland and Germany, kids can't play sports at their schools. So some will play with a local club team instead. To quote The Atlantic, most schools not staff, transport, ensure, manage, or glorify sport. Because, well, why would they? Coincidentally, maybe not so much, both of these countries rank well above the U.S. in academics. In 2012, a school district in Texas, the state which was the inspiration for the book and then TV show Friday Night Lights, which documented high school football in the state, well, found itself faced with the threat of being closed. Despite having just a one-win football team, the school decided to lay off eight teachers, close its middle school campus, and forgo hiring any new art or music teachers. Football, baseball, basketball, tennis, track, volleyball, cheerleading, they all remained untouched. Despite football's cost of $1,300 a student, first math's cost of just $600 a student. At my school, lacrosse players aren't asked to pay a penny because there should be $1,000 cost per player. Further, the school sends them on coach buses instead of regular school buses to haul away games and tournaments. This emphasis on sports has even spilled into alumni giving. As a reward for their two national championships in the past five years, each member of the team was given a watch by a generous alumna. Sure would be nice if the astronomy club got that telescope they've been asking for all these years, though, one in it. The robotics team has also done pretty well. In fact, they played sports in the world not too long ago. However, they only saw 60% of their budget approved. Students in a club for kids interested in entrepreneurship and business called DECA, well, they have to pay 80% of a $1,500 cost per person throughout the course of a year. This DECA team, they also do pretty well. In fact, they led our district with 80% of their members qualifying to advance from a district competition. However, school only let about half of them go. Contrast that to our crew team, who despite having only 26% of their boats qualify at the city regatta, the school petitioned four and then ended up sending 83% of boats onto the next round. In addition to large budgets, our sports teams also are able to boast co sizable coaching staff, unlike our model UN debate and mock trial teams, which often only have a faculty member there with, an expert, with a lack of expertise in the matter, they're there to oversee meetings. Our varsity and junior varsity lacrosse team have five outside coaches. In my area, it's not uncommon for 10% of a class to be committed to top colleges on sports such as lacrosse by the start of 10th grade. Field hockey players may even commit in 8th grade, which brings up a few questions, a few issues. Most students are accepted in the college in 12th grade. So why, short of finding a cure to cancer, are we accepting kids to college two to four years before 95% of their peers? A top 10 school squash coach told a prospective athlete that all she needed was an 1800 SAT and no C's on her report card to get into a school whose average SAT score was 400 points higher, 2200. All told, the average class at Harvard, Princeton, and Yale is composed of 12 to 15 percent recruited athletes. But ask yourself, have you ever heard of a student being recruited to college for their academics or academically minded extracurriculars? Probably not. Instead, they must sweat it out and be nervous wrecks through senior year. My school, uh, to their credit though, Brown University, well, they've begun to scale back athletic scholarships and cut their amount of varsity teams. Perhaps they realized they'd be better off giving the money to the 30 possible next Mark Zuckerberg than fueling the best possible ski team. My school tells students not to post college admissions decisions on social media to preserve their privacy and not upset any peers. However, they see no problem with hosting grandiose signing ceremonies for recruited athletes, the pictures of which they quickly publish online to their website. 
My grade also touts a national violinist and our state representative in the National Geography Bee. So you can probably guess, neither of these two boys had a signing ceremony, nor did they ever join the sports teams in Monday morning assembly announcements. I asked a board member at last year's cum laude induction ceremony for students in the top 10% of GPA in their grade, why I was moved from an all high school event to behind closed doors. Told me it was because the student body no longer respected the top scholars in each grade enough. And don't get me wrong, I love my school, but this is a nationwide problem. And at this point, you probably think it's easy street being a high school athlete. Wouldn't we all want to be one? Well, in hindsight, I'm actually kind of glad I wasn't. Students are coerced out of missing family vacation time and religious events to attend practice. And kids who pay to attend coaches' summer camps receive preferential treatment. So I think top athletes should have the ability to play for a local club team. Without a doubt, they should be able to follow that path. But it shouldn't disrupt or affect the education of their peers. Look at top soccer academies in Europe, who recruit the brightest soccer stars from a young age so as to not disturb the education model for the vast majority of their peers. Europe's emphasis on intramural sport has also led to an overall healthier public. And Europe's separation of sports from schools has led to another benefit, as highlighted in Amanda Ripley's The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way. In Finland, the number six ranked country in the world for education, teaching is a prestigious position, requiring at least six years of higher education and a residency. In the United States, becoming a teacher is relatively easier. In fact, Less than half of the math teachers in this country majored in that very subject. The caveat? In some of these instances, when we hire underqualified teachers, because they can also say, for example, coach the football team. The United States is the number one spender in the world per capita on education. We also are seemingly one of the few countries to not heed Nobel laureate Jim Heckman's advice and divert most of these funds to younger education when the brain's developing the most. Lastly, we rank in the middle of the pack along with a group of developing nations of the 64 countries to take the PISA examination, a test designed to measure a 15-year-old's ability to solve 21st century problems. Why? It's not because we're this recklessly extravagant spender, the biggest bureaucracy to ever grace mankind. Rather, it's because, as study after study shows, we spend more per athlete than we do per student. So I ask you, what is the opportunity cost of the 10 hours a week our kids spend at after school sports practice? What is the opportunity cost of the $164,000 SEC athletic conference schools spend per athlete? 12 times as much as they spend to educate their average student. Let's imagine a different world. We encourage recreational sports where kids don't drop out because they're not on the varsity track. We separate sports from school. Artificial intelligence and 3D printing training become ubiquitous in schools across this nation, as does an extra teacher for coding and an increased arts budget. Our newspapers and school websites highlight the achievement of our top scholars. And from personal experience, I think students would use this new time productively. I work with a group of students to solve civil problems through incentivized competition, such as computer literacy in the inner city or food safety in Beijing. Added time would lead to improved mental health and decreased stress. I'm not here to kill fun. I'm here to say, however, that we need to return the purpose of our educational bodies to actually teaching our next generation. And I'm not alone on this. The NCAA is already having internal conversations about early recruitment, a phenomenon it refers to as an elephant in the room. The challenges facing us are daunting. In order for our students to launch another great age of American accomplishment and innovation, we need to fundamentally change the way we operate as a society. So the next time your kid gets home late from a soccer tournament and doesn't do work due to fatigue, you read in your newspaper about the joy of the local middle school committing to Princeton. Or you spend your Sunday afternoon watching bikini-clad women sell hamburgers in between football games. Ask yourself, 
Are we Rome? Thank you.